renewable energy is an important part of the of the mix and at the moment we we actually don't use very much renewable energy except for hydroelectric power and, and that's quite good that that provides about six percent of, of world energy sixteen uh, percent of world electricity uh, but all these new things people are so enthusiastic about or some people are so enthusiastic about and wind farms and and solar energy and biomass and all these things they don't amount to more than about one or one and a half percent I would like to see them get Get up to something like 20%. That will be almost impossible to do. Um, and so then you'll have a mix. Uh, but the, renewables can't on their own change the world, as some politicians seem to think. And they'll have to be mixed, in my view, with a large chunk of nuclear power. Uh, and then we'll have to try to burn what fossil fuels we burn in a clean... And, and when I say clean, I don't mean... I, I mean, get, taking the carbon dioxide out of the out of the effluent and not making climate change worse. So, I mean, it's a, a balanced approach is what's required. What I really do dislike is the way that people will set renewables against nuclear power. It's one or the other. Yes. There's too much polarised thinking, and of course, there are too many political personal agendas. The International Panel on Climate Change are the people to listen to, uh, and some other climatologists. The people not to listen to are some of these uh, scientists who, who are not climate, I mean, have not really studied the subject properly, uh, but have been provoked one way or another into casting doubt over climate change. Um, there has recently been a, a Channel 4 uh, program um, which I think is, I was going to say mischievous, but that's not right. It was sensationalism, a very sensational programme, and, and it was untrue, and the, the scientists that they got, and one or two of them have claimed to be misrepresented uh, in it. The producer is famous for producing programmes in which uh, he misrepresents people to make a sensational point. I think Channel 4 it, it tried to distance themselves from the programme, but then cynically they re-ran it a week later. And, and here I, I do think that the media, and particularly the television, um, has quite a lot to answer for. And, and uh, to be frank, I think all they care about are uh, viewing numbers uh, and so on. But this is where I think it's a really, it's a worrying because now, I mean, another, not just my, my niece got in touch with me from the south of France about it and said, well, it seemed sort of convincing to her, but the chairman of a large engineering company rang me up and said, well, I watched this program, Ian, you know, and I, I think that, that maybe they, they, these guys have a point. Now, anything that casts doubt on the validity of the climate change theory is, is music to the ears of politicians, because if in doubt, they would love to do nothing. And so I think it's going to blunt action which we actually really need to take. I think we only have a 10-year window of opportunity to get anything done now. And if we let it slip and slip and slip, then we really are in trouble. Well, what's happening is that the carbon dioxide um, levels in the atmosphere are rising steadily, despite what politicians and other people say about them, even in this country, because they are rising here too. Um, and <laughs> within about 10 years, we will, we will have got to a state of about 500 parts per million. It's about 390 parts per million at the moment, unless we do something pretty drastic and pretty soon. If it gets above 500 parts per million or so on, then there's a real danger that global warming will run away, it will, it, it will accelerate. And I also already see the signs of procrastination on the part of the all sorts of people, and Greenpeace have been particularly unhelpful in, in saying that the, uh, that the nuclear consultation was not done properly and getting a judicial review, and, and so that's, that's got put back. Uh, and that is why I think that any, any suggestions now that, that the climate change theories based on carbon dioxide that, you know, are not true, are lies in fact, as has been suggested, is extremely damaging. And we, we've got to be making decisions that in, in, in the UK, I hope that the Energy White Paper, which is due out in May, I hope the Energy White Paper does, does actually make some sensible decisions. That's what we're looking for.
I think that the, the penny has dropped uh, at last with the politicians. Um, and we've had a series of reports that have come out, of course. I mean, there's the, the energy, our own energy review of, uh, of last year, the Stern report. Uh, we have the IPCC report, or the summary of it anyway. And we also have the European uh, energy strategy. In fact, we're beginning to drown in a, in, in a sea of statistics. I mean, some of these reports are seven and nine hundred pages long. Um, and I'm not always sure that that's a very good idea. Um, there is a danger there, of course, that too much analysis leads to paralysis. And I, and I, I thought initially that perhaps that wasn't going to happen. But I'm getting a little bit worried now about the, the continuing analysis. But let us be optimistic and suppose that decisions are going to be made. Frankly, I, I'm very much in favour of, of the EU making decisions. I know that there are groups of political groups in the UK who are not so enthusiastic about this. Uh, but I can, can I mention an example of the, in the 1980s, uh, it, there was a great worry about acid rain. It was destroying forests in Germany and Sweden and places like that. And, and it was said that it was coal-fired power stations producing sulfuric acid and all the rest of it, which was denied by, uh, by uh, our people, particularly the Central Electricity Generating Board. They said there was no evidence that it was actually happening and they would have to have a five-year study by the Royal Society before any decisions could be made. Everybody in the rest of the world knew that that was what was happening. But, the, but we did these, these delaying tactics. And eventually, the, the EU just put its foot down and drew up these, these rules. Uh, and so we had, to, we had to fall in line. And a very good thing, too, that we did. And uh, I'm hoping that we're going to get the same sort of sense out of the, out of the EU. But you can see already the motor industry is now, uh, particularly in Germany, is, is up in arms at the suggestion that uh, the emissions had cut right back to 120 grams per per kilometer is it I think it's something like that um, and you know we're going to have to bite the bullet and, and, and do these things and not procrastinate the Chinese have been amazingly successful with two five-year plans one following the other and their their economy has grown at something like eight percent a year for the last eight or nine years and it's worth bearing in mind that for a developing country as indeed they they are if you want one percent growth in the economy you need a 1.5 percent growth in the energy supply you know this is there are very few laws of economics that i'm prepared to believe but this one seems to work now that means that they that they that they're constrained at the moment uh, by by lack of power amongst other things and uh, that's why at the moment they, they they commission a new power station of one kind or another hydro coal nuclear and so on one new one every week I mean, the, the, the whole mind boggles to contemplate the enormity of this particular problem. And now they're racing ahead. You, you can't say to them, can't chap, slow down. Uh, it's it's going to cause all these, uh, all these problems. I remember in, in, in the 1980s, I was in India with Mrs. Gandhi, when they just announced a nuclear program, in which the French were helping them with. And I said to her, Aren't you worried that there might be an accident or, or something like that? And she said to me, if there was with one of these stations, how many people would it kill? And I said, oh, say a thousand. And she said, every year floods in northern India kill 5,000 people. This year, and because it was September, and it'll happen again next year. The economy is, isn't improving at all unless I, unless I give a boost to the economy, and that means more energy, then it will become politically unstable. And of course they did because she got uh, murdered uh, a few months afterwards. Now, th those are the choices you have to make. Are you, going to, are, you, are you going to worry about jobs? Are you going to worry about the environment? Um, if those two things coincide, then jobs become more, become more important uh, at the end of the day. And remember that about 80% of the world is the developing world and 20% is the developed world. And even if, we, even if we reach a stage where we don't use any more energy per head, it's not going to make a heap of the difference because the other 80% are, are going to go racing along. So, I mean, there really is a serious, a serious problem and, and decisions have to be made.
well, I'll be positive about it, but to start off with, I'll say, to try to change people's habits and aspirations and so on, um, the politicians and the social scientists aren't going to achieve that. We're, we're much the same now as we were 2,000 years ago. Now, the scientists are very good at dreaming up what appear to be solutions to these problems. They do fancy calculations to show that there's you know, enough uh, energy falls onto the earth in a fortnight from the sun to last for 100 years, these kinds of things, uh, which are all very amusing in their way, but they're really no, no help either. That, that kind of thing has to be translated by engineers in, in, into reality. And it takes time and it takes money and it takes very clever engineers. The engineering is more difficult uh, than the science. However, I'm a great believer in high technology and I think uh, that the only solution is to go down a high technology route and one, I mean, there is one route th that we know is available to us and we know it works uh, and that is what's called the fast reactor or the breeder reactor. We built one, we built two actually in this country and then uh, it was decided perhaps you wouldn't need them for 30 years so the politicians closed them down. Now the top bottom of it is this, that the, if you go down the fast reactor route you use uranium 60 times more efficiently than we do in today's thermal reactors um, and if you go down that route you find that that you multiply, effectively multiply the world's energy resources about 30 fold, something like that. It means that there's going to be enough electricity for a thousand years if we go down this high technology route. And what is more, it's not putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So there is an engineering route ahead that we do know. We know it works. We know more or less what it costs. Now, do we have the political will to go down that sort of route? And are we prepared to help developing countries develop that route themselves? That's how I think aid should be. I don't yes. think we should just be dishing out money to them. I think that we should say, OK, guys, we'll build you a couple of reactors and, and we'll train your people to make use of them. Now, if we go down that route, then I think we will be able to see, I can see, you know, daylight at the end of the tunnel. I've been involved with the World Energy Council for a long time, which is a large, impressive organisation, and we meet every three years for a very grand discussion and conference. We met, I remember, in Munich in 1980, and we were talking about Africa then, and uh, somebody who was very expert in, in the whole African situation got up and said, uh, in fact, Africa's probably doomed. Um, and as far as we can see, things are just going to get worse. Uh, this is 19, 1980. And oh, all sorts of people said, what a terrible thing to say and uh, all the rest of it. And I felt inclined to agree with him. And of course, he was right. And, it, and it's been downhill since then. Now, I have a feeling in one or two African countries, it has just bottomed out. Uh, it's going to be a long, hard struggle upwards, and it's not made any easier by the, by the corruption and the murder and the complete incompetence of the politicians there. And is it, is it any kind of a democracy? Why did we and the French leave Africa so that they could have democratic elections? Dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. And I mean, I, I think that that was sort of rather foolish optimism on the part um, and pressurization on the part of our politicians and it's shame we did that but I'm, i think maybe it's it's turned the the corner it's always very difficult to know how valuable a, a day talking around subjects are you only need one worthwhile thought to uh, sink into one mind that can actually do something about it, and then it's probably been worthwhile. I would, I would like to have seen a lot more sixth form uh, students at the conference, because in, in my experience, uh, the people I really like talking to are seven and eight year olds, marvelous, and they know little chips on their shoulders, they're full of beans and full of bright ideas. After, so I'm, after that, it comes undergraduates, because they're bright, clever, people and I enjoy being with them. By the time you get round to their parents, they're pretty well unteachable and they're set in their ways and uh, they're not going to change their lifestyle. Maybe when you get to the older members there, they, they have become more reflective. Uh, but that's why the, the best thing to do really is, is to teach and talk to the to the younger people. So I was sorry there weren't more young people there. But that's where the future must lie, yeah? not with the retired person sitting around 
and uh, listening to talks. <laughs>